Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike here. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. It has been a minute, I have to say. It's been several weeks since I put on an episode. Nobody's like jamming my inbox with where have you been or anything. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or y'all are just being incredibly patient. But I have uh, two weeks ago, I was out of town doing chasing cardboard and going and looking at some collections in West Virginia. And this past week, I have been bedridden with uh, what we have come to find out has basically been a really bad case of the flu. And so I was like knocked out, not wanting to do anything. And so unfortunately, I didn't get an episode out uh, last week. But this week, super important week, really important week for our country, right? I mean, we've got uh, the elections are happening. We're recording this on a Sunday, but by the time you hear this, um, the elections will have happened. And there's a really important day. If you're listening to this on release day, which will be Wednesday, the next day, and that's Veterans Day. And all the things that you'll hear and talk about around your offices and with your friends and family about elections and our country and the divisiveness and everything that's going on. It's kind of ironic that just a couple of days later, we celebrate our veterans, uh, men and women who sacrifice and work hard to protect our freedoms and and protect our country, protect our nation. And I think that's something that no matter which side of the aisle you're on, which, you know, ideological principles you may hold, I think we all can unite around our military. I have a lot of friends that are in the military, that have been in the military, family members, etc., And I have the utmost respect for those people and what they do and what they give up and sacrifice. And there is a lot of sacrifice. Uh, Talk to anyone that's been in the military, there's sacrifice. And that sacrifice has spilled over into the baseball world. And we, um, historically speaking, have had a lot of major leaguers serve uh, predominantly World War II, World War I when we were in those rallying the country type times in our nation's history. And it's important not to forget those people. It's important to forget that. So I want to connect uh, the the veteran idea and this thing we need to all be supportive of as our armed forces and the history of baseball and, and kind of take you back, which is all vintage kind of stuff. So I brought somebody on that we've been talking for months about this, my guest and I, and we are, both passionate about it. He's really passionate about it. So I'm really excited to have him on. I'll bring him on now and we'll kind of get his story. It's another Mike. There's not enough mics in the <laughs> hobby. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, tell me, all right, tell the story. Why did you contact me and why did you want to talk about this stuff? So I, as everyone else, as as I got as a child of the '80s and '90s and collected baseball cards then, and then got back into it, 2016, 2017 or so, um, and I was trying to develop my kind of PC. And <clears throat> I'm from Minnesota originally, so I was kind of got early Minnesota twins. Um, but even as a kid back then and, and today, like vintage cards is where I was at. Like this is just where I always was interested in and wanted to collect. And I bought a lot of 52 Bowman and I'm sorry, 51 Bowman. And I, I was, uh, cause I was collecting Washington Sander cards cause they became the twins in 61. And I was just looking through 
And I got this card here, Lou, Lou Brissy. Just a common. No one's really heard of him. But I was just reading the back of his card. And it said he served in World War II, fought in Italy, and an artillery shell shattered his left leg. And he convinced the surgeon um, not to amputate because he was a minor league ball player. Um, and that would, that would be it for his career. And he ended up making it to the Cleveland Indians, played two seasons, and he had a specially designed leg brace to, in order so he could pitch and be a player. And I just thought that was an amazing story. And, like, how do we not know more about this guy? Um, and so being a veteran myself, I served in the Army. I just started going down that deep dive rabbit hole of, of one, my general interest in military history in World War II, but like baseball and discovering the players. Cause we all know about, you know, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio and, and, and for some Bob Feller, um, a lot of the, the hall of famers and, and the famous guys we knew that served. Um, but it, one of the facts I give when I trap people, uh, when I talk about my baseball card collection is um, by 1945, over 90% of the 1941 major league roster, those players were serving in uniform, were serving in the military. Um, and, and that just got me down, you know, understanding the long history between baseball and, and the military. It goes all the way back to the Civil War. Um, one of the very first photos of a baseball game being played is from the Civil War. It was a bunch of Union soldiers at Fort Pulaski in the background of a photo was playing a baseball game. Um, and it, and it goes all the way to today, um, where we had, um, you know, a, a, a minor league player named Steven Reich. Um, he was signed by the Baltimore Orioles in, in the late nineties. He played one season in double a ball, um, found out it wasn't for him, went into the military, became a helicopter pilot and, and was tragically killed in Afghanistan in 2005. Um, and so this relationship has gone on th through almost every single conflict and through all the players. And so it, it just made me really appreciative um, and it allowed me to build a, a PC now. So I collect players who served in the military, particularly World War II, and that who were either wounded or were decorated uh, for their service. Um, and it's, it's an amazing kind of like, there's a lot of players. There's a lot of guys we've probably never heard of um, that did a couple seasons in the major leagues that had an incredible wartime experience or did amazing things. So that's just now I built my entire collection around. That is so cool. First of all, thank you for your service. And, you know, collecting is all about connecting, right? And it's connecting dots for us personally, whether it's family history, family, you know, where we grew up, what experiences we've shared, and we try to connect those dots with cards. Why, why do cards matter in terms of like, you can still read all the stories, but how do the cards change it for you? What does that add to that experience? I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you one card and this is why I do. And I think this is what's unique about the collection, what we do. So this is a 1917 Z nut, uh, San Francisco seals, Len Hollywood. Len Hollywood was signed by the Detroit Tigers at 19, 1916 at age 18. Um, they sent him to the Pacific Coast League to develop um, and played one full season with the San Francisco Seals. Um, after that 1917 season, he volunteered and enlisted in the United States Army in World War I um, and was tragically killed on November 3rd, 1918, eight days before the war, just a couple, I mean, a couple days ago. Um, and... You know, I, I think on a personal to think that his parents didn't know that he died till January 1919. So the war ended on the 11th, which was original Armistice Day, which is now Veterans Day. Um, they found out after and they sent the way the Detroit Tigers found out that he, he, he tragically died was they sent his contract back to the Detroit Tigers. And on the back, they had written killed in action November 3rd, 1918. Yeah. Um, I bought this car for 20 bucks on eBay. You can look it up right now. It's the only Len Hollywood Z nut card that was sold on eBay. It took me years to find this card. Um, but it's an honor and privilege. I, I, it, it is important for me right now to tell you all the story because now 
we have a we have a piece of his legacy and we can then tell that legacy and we can talk about his sacrifice to the country his small even if it was a small impact on the game of baseball and then also what could have been right um and and i think that's extremely important i think that's it i think that is very unique to our community to collecting baseball cards is that these unknown players that would have been lost to history right we can find this piece of cardboard tell their story and then his name lives on you know len hollywood one year of professional baseball pacific coast league and he served his country in the second infantry division you know died in muse on gone force so ironic because uh just this last weekend i had a conversation with uh dr james beckett and we talked about how important it is to share knowledge to pass on knowledge to tell stories we were talking about it in the context of the history of different sets and where they came from and and but you're talking about it in a completely different context which i think is probably more profound and, and certainly more meaningful in in terms of just remembering and and it, I, I think it's awesome that you're carrying on those stories and and passing them on and uh I, I absolutely love it so that's a great story when world war ii have let's talk about world war one first yeah um and then we'll go to world war ii i know that's your your kind of specialty is world war ii but one of my favorite world war one stories is of course you know many hall of famers you know world war one was kind of the, the the great war right and mm -hmm baseball in world war one lots of players went and served uh i mean i'm looking at a list of hall of famers that served in world war just hall of famers not yeah. everyone else right but guys like herb pennock and branch rickey who later became and part of branch rickey's um development of his ideologies about race was formed from his time in world war one in the army where he served alongside people of color and, you know, just uh, Casey Stengel, Trish Speaker, George Sisler, uh, Wait Hoyt, Harry Heilman, Eddie Collins, and then Ty Cobb and uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander, who was, had basically came back from the war shell shocked. Um, he had, hearing problems for the rest of his life. Uh, it probably drove him to become an alcoholic. I mean, the, the, his experiences and probably the horrors that he saw in World War One. And then Christy Matthewson's one of the most tragic stories to me because what a great ambassador for baseball that he was, what a great person he was. He served with Ty Cobb in the newly formed chemical service. And he did that in 1918. He joined enlisted in the in the United States Army his wife was totally against it but he insisted on going felt it was his duty and when he got to France he was accidentally part of a yeah. uh, training exercise that he was accidentally gassed and sub subsequently developed tuberculosis which is a, a just a, a lung disease that was much more easily infected to damaged lungs and so that ultimately killed him at a very early age which is tragic. I mean, you think about how war specifically, people serving in war and the, and the you mentioned one gentleman who died in 1918 uh, that played one year, the, the trajectory of lives that, have, mm -hmm. that are changed by that. And the, the course of history is altered uh, irreparably by these things that happen. I mean, uh, World War One was was big, but then World War Two, even bigger, right? In terms of participation by yep. the baseball. Well, and and it even goes back. I mean, it goes all the way back to the Spanish American War, where we had Bill Stearns, which was a National Association baseball player for the Washington Senators back when before Major League Baseball existed. He was killed in the Spanish American War. Um, so, like I said, it goes all the way back to the Civil War but and, and the history of baseball. But Eddie Grant uh, was killed in the First World War. 
Um, eight major league or former major league players were killed in the First World War. Uh, 32 minor league players were killed in the First World War. And this is the only of the eight players, Eddie eight Grant, um, who was a major uh, in the Army, was killed in the Muir Forest in 1918. He's the only one with a baseball card. Um, and, and Len Hollywood and Larry Orville, two minor league players, um, they're the only two that I could find that had baseball cards. So, like, you're right. The, the Honoring their legacy, getting getting kind of that piece of an artifact of their of their playing days. Um, that's part of my collection. And it's it's both fun and just really, really frustrating because I got to do a lot of research, try to track down and like go to trading card database and just see if there's a card that existed. And then learn about a lot of minor league tobacco cards that like, you know, no one knows about. And then I can't find. But but no. So World War Two. So part of it is the impact of. The war on Major League Baseball, which I, I said about over 90% of Major League players from the 1941 roster uh, were in uniform by 1945. Um, and the same conversation was had in World War I as well was should baseball continue during wartime? Should Americans go out and, and, and have fun and watch baseball? And um, Sporting News, um, the magazine, the big sports magazine at the time, um, during both wars, pretty much argued that you got to have baseball. It's America's, it's America's pastime. It's America's game. It's morale. Um, and, it, and so um, the commissioner, uh, Kenneth Strong Mountain Landis, uh, who was commissioner in 1941 Major League Baseball, um, petitioned fairly hard uh, for, uh, to FDR um, to allow baseball to happen. And so FDR um, uh, passed the green light memo, which basically was the green light for Major League Baseball to continue. Um, and a big impact there was the concept and allowance of night games. Okay. Before we didn't have night games, technology was fairly new for big floodlights like that. But um, for all the factory workers working, you know, 12 hour shifts and, and day shift and night shifts, they wanted night games to happen in major cities so people can go and enjoy baseball, even if they were working a full shift during the day going at night. Um, one of the other really interesting things um, that that Major League Baseball did, of course, was was to support the war effort. So you had relief games. So every um, baseball team had special had designated games during their season, which would be called relief games. And all the ticket sales um, would be donated to the Army or Navy fund. Um, the fans would be encouraged to buy war bonds, and it would you know it was a big event. And so for us looking back, I mean, there are crazy times like the 1942 Yankees game against the Washington Senators, um, the pregame kind of festivities was uh, Babe Ruth going two for 17 against Walter Johnson um, and having Hornace Wagner and Tris Speaker bobble a double play. Um, so you had these like little expedition games or glorified batting practices of all these, well, dead ball era heroes and all-stars and the hall of famers as we know them but for them just these were the all-stars um and i've been desperately trying to find some type one photos of like babe ruth and walter johnson like going toe-to-toe -to -toe, um <laughs> you know decades past their prime um at yankee stadium um the other the other bit effect and this had kind of longer lasting consequences for baseball as a game was that in 1941 you had 44 minor leagues um, around the country that that either were affiliated with a minor with a major league team that was part of the farm system or just professional baseball that was being played by yeah. 1946 there was only 12 leagues left um, and so you see kind of post-war America baseball still a big game you still had some wonderful decades but you saw that okay now there's less and less opportunity for guys to get into baseball um, there was just less leagues, less people wanted to play semi-professionally, and you know the rise of the other sports. Um, and, and 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 then finally, kind of the integration of baseball. Okay, the um, it, it started during the war, so you had kind of specialty games. Um, the Kansas City Monarchs, led by Satchel Paige, um, in '44, played against a Army All-Star League led by Eno Slaughter and Dizzy Dean. Um, you know, beat them three to one, um, which would have been unheard of post uh, pre-war. 
you know, a, a Negro League team playing an all-white team um, of, of Major League All-Stars. Um, then, of course, we know the story of, of, of Jackie Robinson in 47. Jackie Robinson's uh, wartime service uh, is a little complicated. Um, he became an officer, served in Fort Riley, Kansas, um, tried out for the Fort Riley Army baseball team, um, but the the base was segregated. The Army was segregated at that time, um, and he was not allowed to play the uh, on the baseball team. Oddly enough, the football team was desegregated, and they wanted, wanted him to play football, and as a point of like, as as a point of pride and the point of 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 honor, there he refused to play the foot on the football team. Um, ultimately, Jackie Robinson's military career was also a little bit controversial. Um, he was court-martialed um, because he refused to get up from a front seat on a on an army bus um, for for a white soldier. Now, Jackie Robinson was an officer, so he felt that you shouldn't be giving up his seat. To an enlisted personnel, white or not, um, and so he was brought up on charges. He was eventually acquitted, but um, he, you know, proved to be quote unquote such a troublemaker that um, they would never let him serve overseas. So he spent his entire military career here in the United States as a training officer, um, and and so then baseball in the military. Okay, the military quickly understood very early on that baseball um, needed to have a role to play in, in the military, in all branches of the service. And so they were quick to basically set up on, on one level, you're just your pickup game of baseball between soldiers. Um, and they had the equipment to go do it all the way to um, the Navy, specifically the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. Um, creating probably the finest baseball team in the 1940s of all of of, of all time um the the commanding officer there captain emmett um was a massive baseball fan and almost to the point of being unethical he had his recruiters write letters to all the all the all-stars all the major league players that were all-stars or, or famous and basically said come join the navy We'll treat you right, um, and you know we'll use you for your baseball baseball talents, and you don't need to worry about like serving overseas or anything dangerous. And so the Great Lakes Naval Station, which is to this day is is the the training station for everyone who wants to join the Navy, goes to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, in Michigan. Um, their base baseball team consisted all of all, all of all stars. To it included. Um, Bob Feller, Phil Rizzuto, Pee Wee Reese, um, Dom DiMaggio, um, and the rest of the nine player squad were all all stars, if not, you know, not, uh, uh, and Johnny Mice and, and, and Schoolboy Row. Like, and they were like a dominant team. And so the, 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 the far end of that is that team then went around and played other bases, their baseball teams but then also played major league teams. Like they destroyed the St. Louis Browns 17 to two, which it's, it's basically you have an all-star team playing just, I mean, probably one of the historically worst baseball teams in the history of baseball, the St. Louis Browns. Um, and like they played the Brooklyn Dodgers and played the Washington centers. Then they, they also played um, the army all-star team um and the the art the services world world series in hawaii in 1944 and i and being an army guy i'll give the navy a little bit of crap because the what it was set up was the army team in hawaii and the navy team in hawaii in pearl harbor were going to play an army navy game and uh the the navy not wanting to lose basically said we need an emergency supply of plumbing equipment to fly in from san francisco and this plumbing equipment needs is is so important needs to be escorted by two sailors and these sailors happen to be dom dimaggio and phil rizzuto to join Pee Wee reese and bob feller against eno slaughter and a handful of major league players and they won uh four games straight and swept the series against the army um and so it was baseball was integrated completely through all of all, all of the military service. Um, and you had just absolutely crazy stories. 
Um, I, I like to dub it as in the most dangerous baseball game ever. Um, in France, 1945, a game, a, a pickup game of soldiers was, you know, playing game of baseball. And in the middle of the first inning, a uh, an Allied aircraft uh, crash landed in left field. Mechanical problems, the crash landed in left field. Unfazed, they they started up the game after it was all taken care of. They started playing. And off in the distance, they saw some British soldiers kind of slowly walking towards them. And they just thought, oh, they're just curious about the game. They're just getting closer. Well, as they got closer, they realized that they had metal detectors on them and they were sweeping for a minefield. So the players didn't realize that they were in a minefield. So they had a delay of game. No one moved an inch while the, while the minesweepers came through and cleared their baseball diamond. Um, <laughs> and so that is... You know, another just an example of just baseball was all through it. And so actually with my ramblings, I'll kind of give you all and the listeners what kind of hypothetically kind of scenarios we all would have faced if you were like a major league player. And it's 1941, 42, 43 as the draft was getting geared up. So, Mike, we now play for the Washington Senators. It's 1942. You've been playing for five seasons. You've been all star for three of those seasons. You are you know, a, a, a franchise player, you know, they, you are one of the highlights. I have come in for, as I said, back in the day, a cup of coffee, minor league guy play for the last nine games, you know, of the season. Um, and just trying to make my way by 42, the draft is in full effect. Um, players are being drafted, not all at once, but on a progressive basis as, we're going through the draft board and getting our medical and getting determined what is our eligibility for the draft. And as you get to 1945, that eligibility increases. So a lot of the players that weren't draftable in 42 because they were too tall or too short or too, you know, they, they weigh too much or didn't weigh enough were avoiding the draft. But then by 44, 45, the army, you know, the need for more manpower. Yeah. Yeah. They were getting drafted. So we both say, Hey, let's serve. Um, you, you enlisted because like Stan Musial in 1944, he was highlighted in a, in a magazine of going duck hunting. Um, and he got a lot of criticism why he wasn't in uniform and he was out going duck hunting, enjoying, you know, uh, enjoying the fall weather while the guys are fighting. So you and your, in your PR team, the team itself is like, okay, let's have you enlist. The Navy says they're going to take you. You're going to join the Great Lakes Naval Station Blue Jackets. And now your full-time job is the athletic director, you know, athletic organizer in the Navy. So your job is to create these kind of beer league games um, for for the players. Um, And it may just be setting up an intramural league on the base. It may be then expanding that intramural league to uh, the region, to the other bases around, or to having special exhibit games for fundraisers that you're playing the local minor league team or you're playing um, even a college team. Or like Zeke Bonnaroo, who was a major leaguer, you know, a Hall of Famer um, from the 30s, he joined the Army, and his job was to create um, a formal baseball system in the North Africa Theater of Operations. So in 1943, once the heavy fighting was done, he created or helped create 150 teams playing in six leagues in Tunisia and Algeria in the North North Africa Theater of Operations. The World Series for that year between the uh, Casablanca Yankees, which was a medical unit, against the Algiers Streetwalkers, which was a military police unit, had in attendance 19,000 fans. Wow. So, like, you you can, you 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 have the potential of doing a lot of kind of really formal baseball playing. So, for me, I'm a nobody, right? Barely out of the minor leagues. Um, I'm going to get drafted. So, I get drafted. I'm in the Army. Um, and as much as during I'm training, I'm identified as a minor league ball player. I've played a little couple of days in the major leagues. I get, I might get called to play to represent my, my unit's team 
against you know a tournament of the other baseball teams within our unit. Um, but I'm not good enough or well known enough to be on a specially designated army baseball team. So I'm just going to go and serve. Um, and of the you know 599 major league players that that were drafted or enlisted in the military, um, the vast majority of them um, just went and served and went and served like Jocko Thompson. Um, this is one of the interesting things about baseball as well, or, or, or just America back in the day. So Jocko Thompson played four seasons with the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, this is his, his uh, 51 Bowman. Um, his back doesn't mention anything about his military service. But Jocko Thompson was in the 82nd Airborne. He was an officer. Um, and part of Operation Market Garden, which was the big Allied airdrop to um, capture the bridges over the Rhine River to allow us to push into Germany, uh, he is, his unit's goal was a secondary bridge over the Maas River in the Netherlands. Uh, him landing with 13 of his men um, near the bridge, fearful that the Germans were going to blow it up, um, bum-rushed the bridge. Um, he kicked out the wires out of the demolition charge. Um, before the Germans could detonate it. And then uh, for three hours, beat off uh, two German counterattacks until reinforcements arrived. Um, came back from the war. He was wounded in the Battle of the Bulge. Came back from the war, played a couple of years in the minor leagues, got called up to Philadelphia. Um, you know, batted, I think, like a 240 at best, um, but then wasted away in the minor leagues for a couple more years and then retired. Um, and that's his playing career. But in 2004, on the anniversary of him taking that bridge, they named that bridge over the Maas River the William Jocko Thompson Bridge in the honor of his. And so uh, another story you wouldn't know, you know, by reading his baseball card, but I just did the research and looked into it. And so his story, much like the other 76 players that were wounded um, in World War II that eventually made it to the to the uh, to the major leagues, um, was was probably more common than a, a Joe DiMaggio or a Ted Williams um, or you know a, a you know Phil Rizzuto that they served, but they served in a very unique capacity to their baseball playing career. Um, and you know there was a lot of debate, and there was even at the time a lot of debate like ah should these guys be treated specially? Should they just should they go and fight? A lot of them did try to go volunteer. Joe DiMaggio was one. Ted Williams was one. Um, but they were such well known all stars that the military was like, we're not going to risk these guys um, if, if something happened to them. Now Ted Williams became a pilot. He was a Navy instructor pilot during the war. He would later go on and serve in Korea. Um, but he, as much as he tried to, they wouldn't let him serve in World War II. Uh, one of his peers, Jerry Coleman was a Marine Corps aviator. Uh, he actually served uh, as, a, as a fighter pilot in World War II, um, called back up um, in Korea, um, and, and um, you know, eventually came back and played a couple more seasons of baseball before he retired. Um, so you have those kind of counter stories to a Ted Williams, that another guy that went and served and played. Um, another, another kind of niche collection that I have um, that also highlights just the incredible stories that a lot of these guys had was that there was eight players, including one umpire that were POWs. They, they became prisoners of war um, and they survived, made it back and then played baseball, major league baseball. One of them is Mickey Grasso. Mickey Grasso was captured in North Africa in 1943, two weeks before the war ended. Um, him and two other soldiers, one of them who was uh, German-American but was Jewish, uh, who spoke German, though, were able to kind of make their way uh, to the Allied lines and was able to uh, run into an American patrol and, and save themselves. Um, Mickey Grasso weighed 90 pounds um, you know, when he was rescued, and by 1947, he was playing for the Washington Centers. Um, just, just an incre incredible, amazing story. Um, Phil, uh, Mishudo, Mishando, 
uh, Canadian, um, played uh, played for the Athletics in 49, did one season with the Athletics in 49. This is his only baseball card. Um, he joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, shot down over the North Sea. Him and the Navigator out of a crew of 11 were the only ones who were able to get out of their stricken bomber. Um, picked up by a, a Dutch fishing boat, handed over to the Germans. And he spent the rest of the war, um, 1942 to 1945, in a POW camp. Um, um, A.J. Donatelli was a rear gunner in a B-17. He was shot down in 44, spent the rest of the war in a POW camp, went back and became an umpire um, in Major League Baseball. So just an amazing, once again, just a, a plethora of stories. Um, Gene Bearden. Gene Bearden was in the United States Navy. He was he was on the U USS Helena. Um, his ship was sunk by a Japanese torpedo in the Pacific, picked up by a destroyer. That destroyer was also sunk by a Japanese torpedo, and then was picked up by a third destroyer, survived, and then came back and played baseball for uh, the Indians. You know, he's I, he, as far as I know, he's the only Major League Baseball player to survive two ship sinkings. <laughs> and make it to be, you know, made the baseball. Um, and so what this all meant when it came back from it all, okay? All these players, you had 4,000 minor league baseball players, which 176 were killed, um, which we know, hey, there, there could have been a future Hall of Famer there, right? There was, uh, there was three former major league players that were killed in World War II. Um, they all really only played a couple games in the major leagues and then kind of hung it up and then and then went and served in the military. Um, two minor league players uh, were possibly awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, once again, these guys had only played a couple seasons in minor league ball and and kind of hung it up and then you know, went and joined the military. I'm not going to name them because I want your audience to go out and discover these guys. I mean, it's crazy to think that, you know, baseball has literally two Congressional Medal Honor recipients, the highest medal, the highest award in the United States. We have, you know, these two guys have them. Um, and so what was the f impact on baseball after this? So um, there's a, a wonderful author, um, actually two authors. One guy's named Gary Bennington that's done a lot of research that I've used a lot to find these players about baseball. And the other one is Stephen Bullock. His war, his book called Playing for Their Nation, um, I highly recommend. It goes into a deep dive into this whole era of baseball. Um, but using, you know, Sabre metrics, he talked about the impact. So, um, you know, there was a drop in playing. Okay, I think we all can naturally kind of guess that there was going to be an impact on the playing ability of players after they came back from World War II. And so there was a marked um, decline. So the 1941 season, and this is, I'm just quoting Stephen, uh, Stephen Bullock here. Um, the, the 1941 season um, had an average rate of 41 um, home runs um, scoring. Uh, and by, I'm sorry, 7.8. Yeah, so 7.8 percentage home run rate in 41 and then 46 it was 6.5 um rbis was 54 percent in 1941 in 46 and it was 44 percent um the biggest thing um the tpr the team player rating in 41 was 0.52 to and it dropped to a 0.255 um in the 1946 uh season so there was a there was a big drop or a, 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 a significant minority drop in, in the statistics of ballplayers, uh, which I think we can all understand, okay? Yeah. Um, to think that Hoyt Wilhelm, Hoyt Wilhelm, one of three major league Hall of Famers um, that were wounded in World War II. Hoyt Wilhelm um, was fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he caught shrapnel in his lower back. So he played his entire baseball career with shrapnel in his lower back. And this is before pitch counts. I mean, this is before, you know, we were worried that this guy, you know, had a had a sore arm and he was just 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 throwing a knuckleball every second he can, he had in major leagues. 
and he played with all that injuries. Warren Spawn is another one. So Warren Spawn was a combat engineer um, in, in the war. He was wounded um, uh, in, in 45 in the Ludendorff Bridge. His unit was trying to repair the Ludendorff Bridge that we had captured from the Germans where the captains were trying to blow it up. Um, and then Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra was in the Navy. He was on a rocket ship um, that was firing rockets on, on D-Day on the Normandy beaches. And he was wounded in his right hand by German counter-battery fire. Now, to think that we may have never have heard of Yogi Berra because he was injured in his right hand. Um, you know, like, really what could have been? So what could have been? We had players like Virgil Trucks, um, Tom Bridges, Larry French, guys who were all-stars previously before the war, but then after the war kind of dropped off. They, they, didn't, they didn't put up the same numbers, they didn't play as well, but those three could have been Hall of Famers. If they kept with the numbers that they were, that they were had pre-war, they could have, maybe they could have been a Hall of Famer. Um, and it even goes to like Joe DiMaggio never put up the same numbers he had pre-war. Stan Musial never put up the same numbers he had pre-war. And so there was that sacrifice. Um, Cecil Travis, Cecil Travis was an all-star, um, very much could have been on track to be a Hall of Famer, but he uh, fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He had gotten frostbite on both of his feet. He returned back to Major League Baseball, played a couple seasons, but wasn't the same, and then left the game. Um, yeah, I think about, oh, and by the way, I've been very intentionally quiet. Because, yeah, I know. I've been rambling. I'm sorry. No, no, it's not rambling. It's education, and it's wonderful, wonderful stories. And this has been, I mean, I'm just mesmerized listening to you, Mike. I'm just staring at you, taking it all in. But we, we talk a lot about, or maybe – the, the guys who collect n new players and modern stuff, they don't understand that Williams, DiMaggio, Musial, Feller, all these guys, they lost years to the war yep. that although there's think of what Williams stats would have been for his career. Had oh, he yeah. not served in two wars, not just one, but two yep. usual stats, DiMaggio, et cetera. Not only their stats that from the time they missed, but how it just affected them mentally and physically and, all the things that it took them a while to get kind of back in rhythm, as your statistics pointed out. These guys didn't come back just going, you know, hey, I'm, I'm the same guy I was before. Let me hit 406 again, Ted Williams, you know. Uh, so it is fascinating to think about what we lost as baseball fans, which doesn't pale in comparison to what they lost, you know, yeah. having to serve, you know. Well, and so, and the interesting thing too is, so Warren Spahn, when he was retiring, he didn't, he was being interviewed um, and the interviewer talked about, Hey, you know, how did you feel? Like you lost, you lost three years of playing baseball to the war. Um, you know, and Warren Spahn said, you know, I may not have lasted 17 seasons if it wasn't for my, for my military service. He said, I did a lot of growing up. I developed a much stronger work ethic. Um, and I just got a lot more discipline um, for my military service. And so that's maybe why I lasted as long as I did. So it, you, you're, you're completely right that a lot of guys all sacrificed. And some of them, the ultimate sacrifice was made. Um, but also, I think it also conditioned them. But also maybe, I mean, I wonder what baseball would have been like if you didn't have a generation of ball players go through that experience. Um, and and ultimately, you know, a lot of them became coaches, right? A lot of them became town scouts. Um, and so to think that that also had a this other unforeseen impact of how players were brought up and coached or or what kind of became of the game, it, it, it's 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 extremely interesting. Um and and once again goes back to it's just wonderful then having the having a card. Having a baseball caller, you know, a Bobby Thompson shot her around the world, right? His fame. He was a bombardier in the war, you know, uh, Vic Wirtz. He was the guy that Willie Mays made an incredible catch off. He fought in the battle of the bulge. Um, it, it just touched everything. Right. Um, even to your, your half cent 
tops certificate. Yep. Um, you know, I, I wrote you about that, but that was so for everyone during the war, there was rationing, you know, there was, there was, you know, you couldn't buy all the products that you wanted to buy, but more important, but also an interesting manufacturers couldn't produce everything they wanted to produce. So tops was a gum company back then, bazooka gum. They, uh, they were limited in what, how much gum they could produce for the commercial market. They had a contract with the government to produce bazooka gum to be added into the ration packs for soldiers and, and servicemen serving abroad, but they can only make so much for resale. So part of their way to keep the gum market going, even though Americans can only spend so much money, was to offer these certificates. And you collect so many of those certificates, on the back you saw, you could buy handkerchiefs, a coffee maker, clothing, which were all rationed during the war. So that was kind of the draw. So this, this, has, a direct, this has a direct connection to baseball cards. Because then after the war, when all the ratcheting was over, and then it was a free-for-all for all the companies to get back their market shares um, from the pre-war, the war, you know, the, during the war austerity, um, they had to come up with ways to attract kids to go buy their gum, Bowman, Tops, everyone else. And they thought, ah, baseball cards, much like the tobacco cards of, the, of, of yesteryear, let's put baseball cards in our packs of gum, and there you go. Now we're yeah. where we're at. All all coming from the war, right? And so, yeah, I mean, back to your point though, you know, these guys coming back and figuring, you know, getting back to it. Yeah, uh, I mean, what could have been, right? And this goes to post World War II Korea, Whitey Ford. Whitey Ford served in World War II, Ted Williams. Um, you had you had players serve all the way through. So I have a couple here. Um, Al Bumbry. Fought in Vietnam. Champ Summers, probably one of the best baseball names ever. Champ Summers served in Vietnam. Um, and you had like actually um Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench and Pete Rose served in the same um Army Reserve unit uh when they were minor league players, kind of to avoid the draft, because the draft was still baseball players, well, minor leaguers at least, were still kind of like a target demographic. Um, so you saw a lot of guys kind of in the Vietnam era who may have wanted to avoid the draft. I'm not going to disparage any of that, but you had a lot of guys serve in the Army National Guard, Army Reserves. Um, and then in the 1950s, you had guys that just, they, they were drafted, they served two years in the military, and they were able to get back into the minor league days or the major league days. So yeah, you, you still had a lot. While we still had a draft, a lot of players serving. Um, I'll, I'll shift to... Uh, a, a secondary topic. So Japanese. So Japan since 1872 has had a relationship with baseball um, that carried into World War II as well, that you had uh, Japanese Nippon League players serve in the Imperial Japanese Army, which I've been slowly been doing the research and, and, and getting a hold of, which has allowed me to understand vintage Japanese baseball cards, which is a whole other conversation we could have. I but bet. but their love of baseball was so was to the extent that um Eno Slaughter on the island of Saipan was playing an exhibition game as a morale booster for the soldiers there. Um, they had to take a delay of game because they discovered three Japanese soldiers uh, in the wood line along third baseline that was watching the game. Um, and also um, in the Philippines, the, the, uh, the army had started a baseball league there playing off of the fields that the Japanese built for their own players to play baseball. And, and um, I forgot who it was, but he, he, he was a major leaguer. He said, these fields must have been designed by a hitter because the the outfields are very cozy, uh, <laughs> the dimensions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I've gone into the Japanese. I've also gone to a little bit of the British. So some players that – a cricket player that was killed in the First World War, um, another cricketer that was killed in the Second World War, um, but then also um, – branching into baseball and basketball a little bit. So actually a football player that I don't know gets a lot of attention, 
but Wizard White, who became a Supreme Court justice. He he uh, he played a couple years with the Chicago Bears, went to Yale Law School on the off season, uh, joined the Navy as an intelligence officer, then come back into football after the war, went to his law career, and then became a Supreme Court justice. Go figure. Crazy. Yeah, we would have. Yeah. Um, as we as we finish up here, Mike, yeah. I wanted to amazing stuff. You mentioned a couple of book resources that people could go and if they want to learn more about this stuff, amazing. I, I, I've learned most of my stuff about war and baseball and the connection there from watching the baseball documentary by Mike, uh, by Ken Burns. Yes. Um, during that forties episode, that top inning, top half and bottom half of the, I guess it's the fourth inning, fifth inning, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, there's a lot of great mentions of that, especially around World War II. The earlier episode does a lot to connect World War One, um, at least very you know thirty thousand foot view stuff. I mean, none of it's super high in detail, but I, I if people want to learn more and and find some of this stuff, where can they go if they if this is something that intrigues them? Yeah, so uh, the first is Gary Bennington. He has a website called Baseball in Wartime. Um, he's done an amazing job collecting, and he has a he has a book as well. Um, hold on, I think I have it here. Quick interruption while Mike goes to get a book. No, I'm just kidding. He's, he's got it. Um, he has kind of the baseball dead of World War II. So he basically biography of the three major league players who were killed in World War II, as well as the 67, 167 uh, minor league players that were killed in World War II. Um, but he has done a lot of research um, all the way, I mean, from, from the Spanish American, actually from Custer's last stand, there was three guys that were like college baseball players that were killed in Custer's last stand, um, Battle of Little Bighorn, all the way to today. Um, and then the next one is, I don't have the cover, but Playing for the Nation, Stephen Bullock. These two authors, I would say, I found the most on when it comes to the deep dive in the players in World War II. Um, and, and they both kind of recommend some other baseball historians that their books touch on or have a chapter on. But these were the only two real books I saw that strictly focused on the wartime um, experience of the players as well as the impact of baseball and then connecting that history to cards you like you said you would find a name you go look them up maybe on baseball reference and yep. then try to find cards that corresponded and all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah so i've i've i've, col I've pretty much com completed my collection of players who were wounded in the second world war um as well as some of the minor league players that had like Mother's Cookies or Remar Bread um, cards, mostly from the Pacific Coast League. Um, and now I've moved on to the First World War um, because there are, much like Len Hollywood and Orville and, and Orville Wilson, um, there are a handful that I've been able to find um, that have either a Z-nut or like an O-back um, tobacco card of their playing days. Um, and so that... That is the the fun part of my, the fun and frustrating part of my collections. I get to try to track these cards down, and then balance out like, how much should I pay for a card that really this might be the only one that exists of this guy. I should just pick it up now, but knowing that the resale value is not going to be quite there if I ever have to sell these cards. But yeah, basically, yeah, baseball reference, then the training card reference, and then understanding a little bit now if they're coming from the Pacific Coast League, I have a good chance of finding a card from them. Or um, the Mid Atlantic um, has, at least tobacco, First World War era, has a lot of tobacco cards of Mid Atlantic teams. Well, very, very awesome. Uh, Mike, your knowledge on this topic is just phenomenal. I appreciate the insight. I appreciate the education that you provided to everybody listening and watching. Um, man, you need to do a YouTube channel, apparently. Uh, I, I, I always think about it, but then, like, I know it's a lot of work and I think my, my, my ego is just too wrapped up that people just hate it. I'm just gonna be like, no, my baseball card collection is cool. Like I just, I, it would just affect me too much, but no, I mean, 
it's like I said in the beginning, it's such a unique thing that we have in our collection as collections and communities. And, and for me, it is really an honor and a privilege that like, I want to keep these guys legacies and names alive. Um, I love because, it. Because, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're so incredible. I mean, I, I, it's really helped me um, in my, in my military service and my wartime experience to kind of go back and look at them and see what they did and what they, and, they and, and what they accomplished and what they went through. It has been an inspiration for me personally in, in dealing with my transition. That is awesome, man. Well, thanks again for being on the show and uh, really appreciate you and guys love to hear comments down below what you think uh, and happy, you know, happy veterans day. No, um but yeah you, I, I mean it's is that what you say i don't I, know i i would do this it's a it's a it's a time to to like i said remember um to 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 pay some some homage and thanks um but i mean i think just 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 to be thankful and hear a story you know yeah yeah and we're all grateful to live in this country and we're all grateful for what those sacrifices have meant to us so if you see a veteran uh on Thursday, November 11th, make sure to tell them thank you for what they've done and the sacrifices that they've made. And that, that's what we, we should do. So thanks again, Mike. We'll talk to you guys soon. And thank you uh, for having me. You're welcome. Keep collecting.